Hi, I'm Kate Elliott. This is Narrative Worlds, your monthly season of talking about writing, craft, world building, and whatever else me and one of my fabulous guests comes up with. So today we were supposed to have Shannon Chakraborty, who's a fantastic um, novelist, whose new novel, I'm, which is forthcoming next month, I will undoubtedly mention a couple of times during the course of this, but due to a medical emergency, she's not able to make it today. Um, I hope to bring her back for season four. Hopefully there'll be a season four. So Nathan Lucas, who has been the tech guy for this the whole time from the beginning has agreed to sit in and we're gonna try something different today. We're gonna try just having a Q and A in which the people who are visit who are here from the Nebula conference platform and Nathan and I will just have kind of a Q and A discussion of whatever questions people have wanted to ask and we're going to see how it goes so who knows um this will be this will be an experiment and it'll be interesting hello nathan introduce hello. yourself nathan i mean hello, i know kate. who i am i know who you are too but please go ahead okay 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 i'll do the whole introduction hi i'm nathan lucas he him uh i've been a volunteer with sifwa for the past three years since Nebulas first started uh, started online. I've been an avid reader, um, working on writing, it's just as it is for everybody hard right now because, you know, pandemic and getting past it. Uh, but you know, I've been helping out with SIFA for um, the past few years, doing stuff with the tech and also heading up the flight crew and also was the virtual division head during Worldcon in uh, DC. Uh, so I've been in the back end of uh, Narrative Worlds, just trying to help this and shuffle it along, so that way every month we can bring a good conversation to everybody. So it's a pleasure yeah. that you're all joining us today. Uh, this is definitely going to be a bit of an experiment. So I'm not so used to being in the front part of the camera, so I apologize if uh, I need to shave. <laughs> <laughs> too late. Yeah, too late. Uh, I'm really struck, Nathan, by how crucial it is that you have been doing all this work. Um, I, I want to make a little aside about the Nebula Conference and how much difference I've seen in like the last five to seven years with the Nebulas before it was, you know, I've been around for 30 years, so I've, I haven't seen it all, but I've seen a lot. And the Nebula used to be a kind of a schmoozy place, right? There would be a few panels, but really they weren't that interesting. And then they would have some somebody, whoever was running it would nominate someone to give us the speech at the Nebula banquet. And sometimes they would be interesting and great. And sometimes there was one time where everyone got up and walked out because the guy just would not stop talking. And he was giving a lecture that I felt bad because, well, anyway, I won't go into that. Um, I felt bad because I knew the person had who had brought him in had done it in good faith, but he was giving a lecture about narrative as if to people who had never written anything before. And after a while, everyone was just like, so there's been the whole range, but in the last, I don't know, maybe about seven years ago, um, no, 2016, I remember like there was a focus on getting the nebulas to do panels that were actually helpful to writers at all levels from from beginning to advance and i've just been so impressed by that so thank you for the work you're doing because you're part of making that the nebula is valuable right you know I, I i appreciate that i do uh i really though think though it's like i'm at the point where i'm like i i do the training i help schedule i do that stuff with the, the flight crew but it's like you know what it's it's a team it's a team effort to bring it up to the caliber that it is and I know that there has been from what I've heard um because I haven't been with SIPA for yeah I know 5,000 years like me since no, wait, no, I, to I, carve things into I stone tablets yeah yeah right yeah. like stone clay yeah uh but I know that there was definitely a push to make it more of uh less of a an award show and more of yeah. a professional um yes and, it, and it's interesting because you definitely see it, and I'm sure you've seen this depending on uh, any of the different places that you go to, and we could even start with that kind of question is, because uh, you go to conferences and you go to conventions, and there's definitely a separation between the two. Um, because with 
actually i'm not sure where i'm gonna go with the question on that one uh, but you do have like the nebulas which are a conference if you will but worldcon is definitely like a convention uh so so you can actually see where there's like a, i don't want to say uh because there's definitely the nebulas are a little bit more professional but where the other one is more of the celebration of genre and one of the, yeah, and one of the things about the nebulas before, it was more kind of like, well, we, we all belong to CIFWA, so we're going we're gonna to hang out together as people in a group. But, it, but this idea that the, the CIFWA can become a place that helps nurture and um, develop writers of all kinds now, because now we're admitting writers from all different media, which is fantastic. Um, and not just traditionally published, but self-publishing, there's all this bringing, just like opening the tent up, right? But also all this professional, because going the professional level of what people can get now is just so much different and it's valuable. And it also makes CIFL more valuable. Then it's not just like an in-group that I got to be in because I, you know, published a novel, right? Now yeah. it's actually something that gives even more it, it, it gives value to people. It's useful to people. And I think that that has helped SIFWA become, well, survive for one thing, as, instead of becoming like one of those organizations that kind of loses its purpose because the world changes around it because the world is always changing. So, you know, going off that, because uh, I was thinking about that. Um, so a couple of years ago when I was in Pittsburgh uh, for the Nebula Conference, um, I went to both of them back to back. And uh, the first year that I was there, uh, you spoke previously of a guest. Uh, this guest for this one was the, oh, uh, Jell Linderkin, uh, astronaut. And he brought in a, a full uh, set of pictures that he showed and he gave a story. And he showed how, uh, for him, it was like the five senses, like the head, the heart, the eyes, the feet, the stomach. And he mm -hmm. told a story based on his time and space and how genre meant to him and how he interacted with the world around him because he was engaged from genre. Because uh, he even sent a picture back to Houston with the question mark of Arrakis. And it was a picture of our own world but it was such a beautiful picture that it looked like a desert planet. Yeah. The second one was uh, Martin. He was a uh, telemonster on Sesame Street. And he uses, uh, and how he uses puppets to interact with kids and teach them stories. So, and as you were saying, it's like it, it helps to give people um, how people interact with the world um, and how it, and how it matters. Um, so it's like I kind of want to go back to you, and because each of these people have seen, they've gone into professions that are not quite like writing stories, not creating the worlds. So what was your starting point? Like, what was the thing that was like, I want to do stories in genre. I want to write and create worlds. You know, I read things that were like science fiction and fantasy novels from very early in childhood. That was what I gravitated towards. And I, I can't quite say why I did. I think that there are people who do gravitate towards this, this fantastical element and many, many people who don't, you know, I didn't grow up a lot around a lot of people who read that. I didn't like, it was like my parents weren't reading it. So I started reading it. I was the one who read it. And I was kind of like, you know, and, and at school, I was the one who read those books, not, you know, most kids didn't read those books because either they weren't reading, a lot of people don't read, they don't get that pleasure in reading, it isn't a relaxing or an exciting thing for them, or if they do read, they read, you know, mysteries or, um, you know, stories set in, in this world, and I even know people who say, oh, I can't read stories that aren't set in this world, because they don't make any sense to me, and um, 
so I couldn't tell you why. I just knew I was that kid who wanted to go on an adventure. And I want to circle to something that um, Nalini is saying in, in the chat um, that I, I so, so I, when I started writing as a young teen, I would start, I would wrote adventure stories and stories with fantastical elements in it set in fantasy world or set in science fiction world. Uh, but one of the, and my very first, a friend and I in, in junior high kind of started writing a cycle of stories about two men. And then, because that was what we read, that was all we read, right? And then I thought, why does it have to be men? This was pissing me off. So that's really kind of the big change for me was right around that 14, 15, where I, where I decided deliberately to start writing these stories that I liked and I, am I going to say here that I read Lord of the Rings when I was 13 and it like completely upended my life and and made me just want to like build worlds that were like these big huge amazing worlds um, and then and I wanted to put women and girls in the heart of them because I was a girl and I had I wanted to do these things so why weren't there people like me in these stories and this is where we talk about representation, right? And that it's a, these days, it's a, it's a complex subject, but I, for me to go back to the most basic element of it, it's who lives in the world. Everyone who lives in the world can be the subject of story and should be the subject of story. There shouldn't be this decision that these people are worthy of story and the rest of you aren't, you know, your lives aren't worthy. We don't want to see you. Or, or the writer may have expectations about who different kinds of people are. And so these prejudices and biases are how they write. Um, and that's why I think it's so important. That's why I think we're living in the golden age right now because I'm just seeing such a, more, a much wider range of whose stories are being told about, but also who's able to write the stories, who is able to get published and be read. So I would say why I don't know why I wrote science fiction fantasy. I don't know why I still write it. I just love it. Um, it's a complete mystery to me. I'm always interested in why people gravitated toward this field. And the, the thing for me about starting long ago when I got my first novel published and I first went to a convention and I'm um, a pretty introverted person. So it wasn't easy for me to go someplace where I didn't know people. I mean, it really, and it, it's easier now, but it was really, really hard then because I had to train myself over the years how to, how to do it. Um, but I just remember when I walked in, or, or, and I mean this kind of metaphorically, it was like, oh, wait, these are my people. These are the people who like this geeky science fiction fantasy because this is before it was mainstream. These are these people. These are my people. We like to talk about the same things. We have the same references. We all know the Monty Python jokes and the, the, the things that happen in Lord of the Rings and, you know, Ray Bradbury, I don't know, Ursula Le Guin, you know. And so for me, it was just like, oh, I came home. I found it. Finally. Finally. Yeah. And, and I want to say something. Jeffrey said something in chat up here. He said, Oh, Jeffrey Jen, he they. I always thought of the nebula folk as the gods of sci-fi and fantasy. Feel so privileged to be part of the gang now. Welcome, first of all. But I gotta say, <laughs> when you are a young woman in this field, especially back in the day, you soon lose any sense that these are gods. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> anyway, I'm not gonna go into all that. But uh, yeah. no, no, I actually I, I would like to actually add on to something like that. And it's more of like I yeah. And I think that also goes uh, to representation as well, uh, just to touch on that for a second, because it, it's it's nice to know that, or it's, it's you can create your stories, you can write your stories, and your stories matter. Every story has interconnectedness, which brings us all together. Thinking of the people that have, like, Heinlein or Asimov and them, it's like, as the gods of writing, it is, they have, were very prolific in when they're writing and what they did, but they were men. They, they were people, they had a start. 
they wrote something and it became bigger than just the words on a page. And, and that's nice to, like, to see that because like uh, a young girl writing a story about adventures, about seeing herself in those adventures is nice because that's how, as you said earlier, like we're seeing that kind of like golden age. And, and I think that's also nice where we have uh, so many fanzines as well. Or not fanzines, but like you have magazines that have short stories, which give uh, authors chances to uh, bring those stories out into the world. Um, and also the internet, because now that the internet's out there, there's more people that can put stuff out yeah. there, more stories out there. And do you see that as like, uh, as been helping, um, uh, I guess, to like keep on filling that well of... yeah. You know, I, I want to I want to say something about there's a couple of elements here, and I'm going to follow up too with this issue of how do we deal with um, prejudices when we see them emerge in in stories. Um, but so one of the things that people often say about representation is like you want to see yourself in the story, which is true. Um, I, I want to add that for me as a writer, I'm not just I, I'm, it's bigger than that. I'm not there even so much to see, I, I don't, I don't self-insert. I'm not interested in putting myself in a story. Um, I only have one thing that was even remotely kind of like that. Um, and I'm, I'll never tell you what it is. Uh, but, <laughs> but it's more than that. It's just like, it's like saying, it's, it's more saying girls and women have these feelings too. For, I'm just going to I'm going to stick with the women girls thing just for the moment, um, because it was so important to my early career and to all of my career. Uh, so it's something I can speak about with, shall we say, authenticity. And it, it's it's like one of the things I remember thinking as a teen because I had to go through a lot of trying to figure out what the heck. Um, why didn't I have, why didn't I fit? So you have to remember, I was a teenager in the 70s and the gender roles were much more rigid. They were much more, uh, and, and we're talking about the gender roles in you know the mainstream American default culture such as it was. And I had to, I understood in my early teens that I didn't want these things they told me that girls wanted. So what did that mean for me? And I fortunately had a really sympathetic junior high language arts teacher who helped me figure out, you know, if I said, oh, I wish I was a boy. Did that mean, I mean, now, now in, in today's world, I might say, oh, does that mean I'm trans or does it mean something else? Those, none of that language was available to me when I was 13 years old, 12, 13 years old. But after it took me a few years to come and I thought no what I want is I want to be me and I want to stop people I want people to stop to if, if I want to play sports that doesn't mean that sports are for boys and that therefore I'm a boy it means that I want to play sports and playing sports is something that girls want to do some girls not all girls not all boys want to play sports not all non-binary people want to play sports you know the language has just exploded in a way but it made me think that, it made me realize as a teen that these were strictures outside me that other people were imposing. So for me to write stories with women at the center of an adventure, I, mean, I wish Shannon was here, of course, because her forthcoming novel is called The Adventures of Amina al-Sarafi, about set in about, I'm not good at dates, it's probably, it, by European dating, it would probably be about 14, 15, 1600 in, but it's in the Indian Ocean world, which is, a, which is, and is, which was an, an entire regional world of people who all interacted with each other, something that in US history, we're really not taught about, right? And it was a world in which most of these people were, were Muslim. So they had a shared culture as well as their different local and regional cultures. But she finds a really fantastic way to make the presence of this woman who is a pirate, a retired pirate as the story opens, and of course that doesn't last, but to make it completely believable based in the history that she would have operated there. 
which I'm sure someone did. And so in a way, when we talk about representation, it's maybe about me personally, but it's also so much bigger than that in terms of like, yes, we can, we don't have to adhere to men don't cry because that hasn't been true historically in all cultures, right? Just just if our narrow view in the U.S. right now, in only some aspects of U.S. culture right now says that, then what does that even mean? It doesn't, it doesn't, it's just an imposition. So that to me is like so, imp oh my God, it's just like the most crucial thing about writing. Um, I, I want to, and when people bring in their prejudices to their writing, um, I want to, to touch on social media. Back before um, social media, social media can be terrible. It can be truly, truly terrible and debilitating, but it's also opened up the conversations in a way that people whose voices couldn't be heard before at least can speak, right? And there's sometimes such people get a terrible backlash um, and other times their voices are maybe finally being heard for the first time. But before, a lot of prejudices could just be in books. And there was just, there they were. Now at least people can say something and it doesn't solve the prejudice. It doesn't solve the bias. But I hope it makes more and more people think about what what they're bringing to the work, both as writers and as readers, why do they have those expectations? You know, why do they think that I, oh my gosh, I remember reading a book many, many years ago in which uh, a caravan of people are going along and they're attacked by bandits and all the women stand and scream. And I thought, really? Really? They're not even going to pick up a knife? They're not going to run? They're just going to stand helplessly and scream because that's just some kind of Victorian you know, notion that women are so helpless that they can't do anything. You know, there's not, there's, there's not a servant woman in there who can wield a frying pan. It, it's just, it, it was such a terrible prejudice about an expectation um, about women's helplessness that I was so struck by. But of course, when I read that, there was nothing I could say or do about it. You know, it, but now, I could, you know, I could review the book and say, this is, you know, this strikes me as ridiculous. Um, you know, yeah, uh, anyway, so that was a really long winded answer. No, 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 it, it's fine because I, it, it made me think of social media because, uh, or even going, going back to the book for one second, because um, sometimes like we have the prejudice that you find in books or in stories, um, even the prejudice that is in society. And sometimes I, I sometimes wonder if it's if it's not prejudice quite per se, but more of like projection, because like the author was like, I, I'm a big strong man, so thus I must protect. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm just like throwing that out there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of a lot of our, I I believe that psychologically we can say a lot of our fears and anxieties are projections of something in ourselves that we hate and fear and can't deal with mm -hmm. um there's a act oh i wish i knew this james oh no and then there's the james baldwin quote man that man is probably the great american writer um what and i can't i'm not going to get the elegance of his turn of phrase but he said the reason the reason people get so angry is because it hides their pain. Only it, it's, he said it so much better. Anyway, someday I will find that quote again. You can search, someone asked me a question and then Nathan will search for that famous quote. Um, uh, is, it, is it possibly uh, the most dangerous creation of any society is the man who has nothing to lose? No, okay. no. It's the, yeah. Anyway, we'll, 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 it's look, 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 James Baldwin, fear, pain. It's um, anyway, but he's, but he's correct. People use aggression. Aggression often covers a kind of pain that has never been acknowledged or isn't understood. Um, anyway. So 
Oh, uh, here's one about paying for the James Baldwin. Uh, this may or may not be it, but I think it is. It's relevant. Is you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. That's actually that's not the one I'm thinking of, but that is an absolutely another fabulous Baldwin quote because he's true. It's right. That's the other thing about reading is reading is a form of conversation with people. It makes us reach out. It makes us see that other people exist. Exist. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And a lot of this, a lot of this about representation, a lot of this about any of those things is about existence, isn't it? Yeah. Who gets to exist? Who do we recognize? Who do we nod to on the street? Who do we turn away from? You know, who do we create as less than human? Who do we exalt? It's, yeah. And everyone, everyone should be understood to exist. And that is the beauty of art, I think, or can be. I mean, it, people bring their own prejudices to it. So going off of that, because of making connections, um, and I want to, you brought up social media for one for a bit of that and i, I want to touch on that real quick um because social media as we've seen there's been a mixed uh, <laughs> i don't know what the the ratio is on this one but like we've definitely seen some bad of social media um because it can create like echo chambers it can bring out the worst people because yeah it's not understanding that that person that exists is is the one you're interacting with on the other side of that page because, oh, you think it might be a bot or something like that. But what I wanted to go with this is what is the, uh, what are the good things that you have seen of making those connections on social media, uh, of uh, being able to interact with me who I'm in a completely different state to being able to interact with people on the other yeah, side yeah. of the world that might be fans. It, it's to me, social media and and I need to I always preface this by saying that social media has been just terrible for for some people, people who've gotten, you know, bombarded or gotten doxxed or gotten, you know, and there's always, you know, there's always a more marginalized and vulnerable people are at greater risk to be attacked. And then, you, of course, you have these whole troll farms and bot farms and disinformation that gets flooded. Um, Russia has been really good. They know how to do it. Uh, um, interestingly, um, Ukraine, all glory to Ukraine, um, also knows how to use social media. They're using it in a much more po well, positive, I, was just, I don't want to say anything positive having to do with this terrible invasion by Russia of Ukrainian sovereign territory. But Ukraine also knows how to use it in a way that makes you really want to be supportive of the Ukraine. And so, but but to step back from all those things for a minute, I want to talk about how restrictive the old the convention world was and how you could meet people if you could afford to go to conventions and how many conventions could you afford to go to and who could you meet in person. And there was always so many people you couldn't meet. And then in the larger SFNF world, there were only a few places books got reviewed back in the day before the rise of the internet. And I remember the rise of the, the World Wide Web. And, that, and, and furthermore, there were only a few places, there were people, there were gatekeepers who would tell you what you ought to think about things. And most people just never even rose to the level at which the gatekeepers would even acknowledge them. And then the World Wide Web happened and suddenly you could like have your little web page back in the you know 90s when i can think about all those different looks that web pages have had over the years and how the how things have changed as you know the platforms got more complex right but but with social media in particular all of a sudden starting with bulletin boards you could start interacting with people and then when social media really hit you could reach people in this huge way that you couldn't before. I actually love Twitter. I also recognize that Twitter has many problems, but I know people all over the world. And because of the peculiar nature of Twitter, which is that you can't write long things, right? It's got to be short. It, so it ne you never get bogged down in it. 
Um, and what this also, so it meant that I could meet more people on that kind of casual basis that you meet at a convention where you may talk to someone for 10 minutes, right? Waiting in line. And then you might see them again two years later. So you can do that. It's kind of like the water cooler or, or the, you know, or the public square where you can see someone, you sit down at the cafe, oh, hi, you know, whatever. So I can have these endless conversations, short conversations with people. But the other thing social media has done that I think is positive, it is has let people say the, the gates, the gates don't hold anymore because you have all these other paths around them. And I think that has been crucial to the changes I'm seeing in science fiction and fantasy as a genre right now and horror too. Yeah. I don't know as much about the other genres, so I can't speak to them. Um, I know that romance, the romance writers are always out ahead of everybody else. They're like the savviest people um, of any Absolutely. writing. Child that makes the most money too. <laughs> group. Yeah, they do make the most money too. They're the, they're the savviest. Um, but it's so, I, so yes, that's the, that's the balance, right? It's got this very, this downside, this very dark and, and side, debilitating side. But it's also, I mean, I'm just, I know so many more people, not well, but I've been able to, you know, touch base with people. It's easier for me to kind of keep an eye on who, who's new coming into the field, right? And because I like to kind of be aware how the field is changing and I like to see new names and, and things. And, um, but it also means that people can talk about books in a much more expansive way. We don't all have to get them filtered through the five places that had reviews where the people who are doing the reviews choose a couple books and they just leave everything else out. And I just, I think that so... I think that's a benefit. I also think that there are people who quite rightly say to themselves, I'm off social media for six months, or I'm not ever getting on social media, which is also, I think, a peaceful way to be. And I think that can also be an important way to be. Um, but for me, like in the pandemic, for example, it was a way for me to kind of stay in contact with people. Otherwise, I would have felt so isolated. Yeah, I, that's that's actually one reason why uh, I really volunteer during this time frame because the before having the interconnected with everybody at least with your local communities and then not having that connection um because we all have to stay inside which it's a good thing that technology is where it is uh because yeah we yeah. we went going into a pandemic because mind you it's possible that because technology with like transportation and whatnot uh is where it is it, excavated the issue because you were able to have more of those interconnected uh those connections where people got sick quicker because you can go from here to china and back again right or from wherever the epicenter of where it starts of any pandemic or any sickness um but what's uh i wanted to actually uh touch one thing you mentioned was it's nice to be able to meet and to see and all the people that are coming in, but it's also like during the pandemic and during like even going forward with technology, being able to talk to individuals, you're no longer a stranger, if you will. Uh, so yeah. the people that you've just met on Twitter, you can meet them at a convention or a conference and it's like, oh, hey, we interacted. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, as an introvert, I actually welcome that. Because it gives me, I don't have to go up to someone. I, I, I'm i not a, an extroverted person who would like go up to someone and say, hi, we've never met, you know, whatever. How are you? I mean, there are circumstances in which I might do that for specific reasons. But in general, it's, there's, I think for introverts, and I, I do think a lot of writers, I can't speak for other artists, but I'm guessing it may be similar for others as well. There's, it's like a bigger barrier you know, you got to like, I got to like uh, store up some energy to go to, go to a convention because I know I'm going to be expending a lot of extroversion time and that gets tiring for me. But if I know someone, if I see their name tag and I had had like this whole conversation, joking conversation about, or, or we had liked some TV show, you know, you, whatever, then I can like, oh, hi, whatever, you know, that, and, and then now we suddenly have something in common. 
that we already know. So it is that little extra piece of, um, it, it, it lowers that barrier just a little. And um, again, I always feel constrained to say there are people for whom, I, I know of people for whom social media has been very, very harmful. Um, and I wanna mention that to show that I'm not ignoring it. And, you know, and that there are reasons that for me, um, I've been able to negotiate mostly around that so far. But um, for me, it's in some ways been a lifeline. And, and, and it's been helpful to me in, go well, I mean, I haven't been to a convention for so long, right? Uh, at least three. 2019, okay, yeah. 2019, Dublin, Worldcon. Worldcon, Dublin. Oh. Yeah. That's the last one I went to. Many people there I met for the first time who I met on social media. In fact, much of my, um, I, I mean, I've been, I was on Genie in 1991. So I've actually met a lot of people online first before I met them in person. Really? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So actually a lot of my social, I mean, yeah, a lot of my convention time has been meeting new people, but also meeting people who I had met online first. Okay. And I really like, I, for, yeah, for me, it, that's just, a, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's different for each person because there's yeah. definitely those times where it's been very bad, very toxic. And sometimes like for some people, it's definitely come out well um i was wondering if you wanted to go into a little bit more about writing now about what about writing we can i was i was just curious because i because uh one thing i was thinking of is we definitely talked about how uh social media can be good with like connections with uh meeting people or and also like how it helps when we're in isolation um but what i was kind of curious was uh because I remember reading your books when I was like first cutting my teeth on fantasy. Um, yes, when you were, tw can I tell you my Robert Silverberg story? Go ahead. Sorry, I've told this before. So many, many, many years ago, I met Robert Silverberg, who al was always very dapper and well-dressed. And I was young. Um, and, and he was um, polite to me. Uh, probably because I was young and wearing a short dress. Those were, frankly, how I, things worked back then. It was uh, ugh. Anyway, anyway, yeah. but he was he was very gentlemanly. And I said, Robert Silverberg, I read your novel, Revolt on Alpha C, when I was in fourth grade. It was the first science fiction novel I ever read. And he got this look on his face. Like, really? Right? Because I think he fancied himself. He was a man who did, who perhaps fancied himself as younger than he was. I, I, and, and, and I'm old now, so I feel that, right? I feel, I feel a lot of sympathy for that. So he got this. So some years later, a few years later, I happened to run into him again. And we had only just spoken for five minutes, right? At most, right? And I said, oh, Robert Silverberg, we met before. And he gave me a look and he said, oh, I remember, right? So many years, now let's skip forward to 2010 Melbourne Worldcon. And I had just had, um, Cold Magic had just come out and I saw him. This was like the third time I'd ever met him and spoken to him. And I saw him, oh, Robert Silverberg. And he goes, oh yeah, I remember you. And I said, well, I have to tell you something. I just had a book come out. My latest novel just came out and my editor wrote in the book, in the, in the letter that went out to the booksellers, I started reading Kate Elliott when I was a teenager. I said, so now it's like you're a grandfather. <laughs> So yeah, so just please, everyone, tell me about how you were reading my books when you were teenagers. I like, was not going to go like full that. circle. Oh, it's on. okay. It's all right. It's all right. My arthritis tells me how old I am. I don't need reminding. Oh geez. <laughs> yeah, but at that point, at least you know when you told him that story. Now you're part of the same club. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm probably the age he was when I told him that story. Uh... 
Okay, I'm sorry. That was a tangent. I apologize. That's fine. Like, I mean, hey, we it's it's one of those things where we look at and we are reminded that we are mortal and we exactly. are, are always exactly. aging. Sometimes beautifully, sometimes life can really bring us down. But that's one good thing about reading is that it can bring us joy. Yeah. It can bring us connection. It can bring us, yeah. it can give us different perspective. There's a lot of things that we can find from reading and writing that it's art. Yeah. But everybody gets their ideas from different places. They all are writing different things because it's always like, well, what is, what's that little thing that takes that box in your brain? You're like, oh, I got to write this. Because, because I was curious, because like, I know I, I, I cut my teeth. Yes, reading uh, back in the day when I started out with like Wheel of Time. And I'm like, I wanted stuff that was similar. So somebody gave me uh, Game of Thrones. Yeah, or, or, no, or Song of Ice and Fire. I, I just, I, I couldn't read it past like the first 20 chapter pages. Um, so I read your series, got through all the books that were out at that point. I've read so many books, don't ask me why. <laughs> it's, all, it's all right. I don't always, people will tell me, oh, remember X and Y, and I'll be like, no. <laughs> there a lot happens in that. That's Crown of Stars. Yeah, a lot happens in that seven volumes. It's like, do I have to go check my notes? <laughs> Yeah, I didn't take notes, unfortunately. Ah, fair. Um, but I know, because, uh, so where I was going with that is you, uh, that was a medieval European fantasy, if you will. Yep. Um, yep. Definitely with a lot of horses and magic and stuff like that. Your most recent one, um, I know you talked about another book, uh, but you had a, the one you have going on right now is Alexander in Space. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, didn't you mention that you had a story, I, I could be remembering wrong, that you had one that just all of a sudden just came out of nowhere and you're like, I just have to put this down. Oh, um, last year, although it doesn't seem like last year already. I can't believe I'm saying last year already. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had to, yeah, so the, the second Alexander the Great in gender flipped Alexander the Great in space furious heaven is coming out in um in April um and the third book is is very complex and it's gonna and and I had kind of like stalled out just kind of I, I think we all as writers there's some I wouldn't call this writer's block precisely um there's a lot of discussion about what what is writer's block and what is procrastination and why do we kind of hit something where we think I need to write this, but I'm not quite sure how to do it. So I'm going to fold my laundry instead, or I'm going to write a whole other novel instead. I mean, the, the creative mind is, I think in, I don't think it can be explained in any quote unquote rational sense. I don't think we can like untangle it and scientifically lay it out and say, this is how it works. I don't think we'll, I don't think we're ever going to know. I, I believe that that is something intangible, that there's some other element there that's beyond maybe the ability to quantify it. That's just my belief. Um, but I had hit that point with book three where I was just like, I was, let me say, procrastinating. Um, I wouldn't, and every time I would think about writing it, I would kind of like flinch. And sometimes you just have to wait and let something settle. Sometimes you have to wait and let writing settle. Sometimes people break from writing because they just can't do it right now, which, and all these are part of the process. It's all part of the process. It's not like you have to be writing every day or arting every day right it's just like you have to figure out what your process is and you have to give your soul room to breathe your writing soul room to breathe in my case I had been working on in my case I just there was I was restless but every time I looked at that book I just was kind of like oh no I'm not ready to go there yet I'm not really to really dive into that and then this thing I had been kind of working on, I'm always working on like two or three or five other projects. Like I have a drawer filled with things that I could write. Yeah, I mean, 
you know, stuff that I wrote 5,000 words on and then I put it aside and I may never come back to it or I may. And I had had one of those things which I had done several different iterations of and I didn't like any of them. And then all of a sudden this, I thought, what if I use this, this element of the material with this character and oh, wait, there can be, oh, right? And then, and then it's just like a grand piano dropped out of the sky straight into my head. And I had at this point, maybe, maybe eight or 10,000 words written of this thing. And in May, last May, I said, I'm just going to write this book because I can, I could feel it. It was, it was just, I, I can't describe it. It was just there. It was ready to go. And I wrote in six months, 240,000 words. I wrote a standalone, I know, a standalone epic fantasy, epic romantic fantasy. And half, I, I often know my worlds better when I start. So I was just making stuff. Some of the stuff I knew that was kind of like the foundational things I'd been building on, the iteration that it was of some previous material. But other stuff, I was just making things up as I was going, well, oh, wait, now I have to decide whether X is true or Y is true. I'm going to say X is true. And then I would get farther and I was like, no, 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 Y was true. So then I'd have to go back and fix it, right? And that's how I got to the end of the story. And then I would have to go back and fix things that I had set up right. But I just, it was just like every day, it was like being a young writer again. Oh, this is why I write. Oh, now they're going to do this. Oh no, this terrible thing's going to happen. Oh, you know, I had one day where I wrote an 8,000 word chapter in one day because it was a single piece. It had to be written in one sitting. It, it was just like, and I never write that much. I'm like a 2,000, 2000 words a day for me is a good pace. That's, that's my solid working pace. If it's a little less, that's fine. If it's a little more, that's fine. But I'm not one of these eight to 10,000 word a day writers. I can't maintain that. So, a, you know, anything over 2,500 words for me is a lot in a day. Um, so anyway, but the, the lesson for me was that I still love writing and that sometimes it's the publishing industry that's what's exhausting and what's stressful. And it helps to remember, for me, it helped to remember that I was fighting other battles and that my feelings of exhaustion weren't really about that deep part of writing, which I still love and making up worlds, which it turns out I still love and making up stories. And, you know, so the book's out on submission now. I don't, it might sell, it might not, who knows, right? But it doesn't matter because I love, I mean, it does matter in others, in another sense, it does matter. I, I need, you know, I need the money, but, um, but, but I wrote it for just the joy it brought me. And ultimately with me in art, I think ultimately, ultimately that for me, that has to be the, the foundation, the basis that art brings us joy to do it. And I think that's definitely good to iterate that right there is that there is writing, which is to make money. There is writing to do for the job. And then there is writing that is just for you. The writing that brings you back to that starting point, that brings you back to zero, yeah. Yeah. that brings you back to like, this is why I did this. It, yeah. If it makes money, great. If it yeah. doesn't, I still it, yeah, it's like it's like the well, you know, you think about the well, a lot of times people say, well, I couldn't write because the well was dry, right? But it's the kind of thing that almost, even though I wrote that much, it refilled the well, the artistic well. It was mm -hmm. like, yeah, I can still do this. I still love this, as opposed to feeling drained and exhausted. And yeah, that for focusing too much on all the ups and downs of publishing, focusing too much on, can I get paid? There's ways to get paid. You know, I, I did magic. I wrote two, two novellas or really short novels in length for Magic the Gathering. And that was what's called work for hire. And I enjoyed doing that because in a way there was no pressure because they said, here's the world and here's the story. And now we need you to stitch together into story. And I know how to do that. So, but, but wasn't, so it was like, I was doing a job. 
And in a way that was kind of restful. Um, so that was, you know, and I wanted to do a good job because I care about my craftsmanship. Um, but, but it was a little different than writing my own work. It was like I was using the skills I'd honed writing my own work. You were using I want to quickly, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was actually going to touch on that, uh, what I, that comment as well. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah, in a second. Um, okay. But I, I think that uh, you had less mental capabilities that you had to utilize because you didn't have to create something from new. You didn't have to create something that was there. Um, with magic, it's it's already there. It's got massive teams behind it. Yeah. You just had to take, and uh, maybe slight guess here, but like here are the characters that need to be involved. Here are the cards that were, well, you wrote a novella, you didn't write one of the short stories uh, because they do, uh, right now they're releasing new uh, products or a new uh, set. So they're doing a short story that also has like card images intermixed between that story. Yeah. And I was wondering, it's like, if you had to do something like that, if like they gave you images because you were working with a novella though, so it might not be the same. No, no, there, there were things, there were, they, I, I can't say a lot, you know, cause you sign, an, you sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, but they, they had, they, they have something they specific, the, the fiction is in service to the card game. Yeah. So you are, you know, so you have things and you want to, you want to get stuff in. Um, so that's part of the incorporation that you do writing it. But it is true that because it wasn't my world, I didn't feel that sense when I'm writing myself that I sometimes feels like, what are people going to think about this? Well, I already knew what people were going to think, you know, the magic, the gathering readers, you know, are going to like the story or not. But it, but it wasn't my world, yeah. right? So I felt that that pressure wasn't on me, you know. Um, I want to come back. There is a, yeah, almost everyone, almost everyone does go through this whole thing. It, it's, you know, this the agony of wondering. Um, and actually, uh, next month is Ken Liu, and we're going to just do a big talk about scope of world building. And then that's February, March, Susan Dennard is coming on. And we're going to talk about um, some of these psychological issues. What, what is like, I can't remember the talk of hers because there's, two, I want to do another one with her next year. But I think this is the one on what if you're too exhausted to write? I mean, this is the one of like, what if, what if writing just isn't there for you? Um, and we're going to talk specifically about some of these more less about craft and more about the psychology and the emotion of writing um, because I want to start bringing those subjects in as well because sometimes it does seem that you know oh you see these people these successful writers they never have doubts except every successful writer I know struggles with doubts and goes through ups and downs and you know it's just it's a hard field so with uh, Susan yeah. it's uh, you're not a failure dealing with writerly fear doubt, frustration, and despair. Yeah, that's the that's the what's what I'll be doing in March with with Susan. Thank you for finding that. Um, I just yep. want to answer the question, how much time do you spend reading versus writing? I do find the two hard to balance. Um, I do probably read less now because I write more. Where I find that it impacts my reading most is in novels. I read fewer novels than I used to. Not because I don't want to read novels, but because um, I read more for research. I do a lot of nonfiction reading. And um, and sometimes I can't read things that are too close to what I'm writing. And I don't mean like in subject matter, but like in like if I'm re if I'm writing space opera, I usually don't really read space opera. I might read fantasy instead. Is that because so, you're afraid of pulling something over? I I can't, I just I I just need to be in that space um, for some reason. Uh, I, I I don't know why. I don't know why, but just this, that's been a longstanding thing for me. And I think that as writers, that's just one of the things that we have to deal with, which is that maybe it, I mean, I don't read as much as I read when I was 16, 17, when I had, I feel like a lot more time to read. Less responsibilities. Probably, I probably did have a lot more time. And and just the the, the way I consume fictions particularly is different because when you're younger the thing about teen readers that I really love about teen readers and and middle grade readers is that they're just like they're like sucking it in right they don't have as much experience of the world so 
partly they're connecting and learning with the fiction they read, whether for good or for ill, who knows, right? But but partly they're just like, they're like, they're like something like, you know, those fish that go along the bottom of the, the floor of the ocean, just like vacuuming things up. And I can't read like that anymore. It's very rare for me to so fall so hard into a novel that I stop thinking about what it's doing. And I'm sorry about that because I love that way of reading. But part of it is just, so part of it is just experience changes the way you read also. Um, are there any last, we're kind of running toward the end. Thank you, Nathan, by the way. You're welcome. And there's the writer sessions next. Who is the writer in the this session? So the author for today that will be there is uh, CL Polk. Oh, Chelsea. Fantastic writer. New book, the the even though I knew the end, it's this fantastic noir 1920s set novella that you could all read because it's fantastic. Um Okay, have a great time at the writer session and any last things? Cake or pie? Cake or pie? How about cookies? Oh, cook. Yeah. See, no one ever. See, cookies, the neglected. Not enough representation for cookies. I mean, I also was like some French uh, patisserie, but that's, that's. How about you? Cake or pie? I'm just going to say yes, everything. <laughs> Cookies. Although I will say Danish pastry is the best. Okay, fine. Okay. You I'm just, it? I'm not, I'm not even, yeah. Tea or um, coffee? Tea or coffee? I have, to, I can't drink coffee, sadly. So I have, to, I love tea, but I, I love the smell of coffee, but I can't, my, I can't digest it. I got some what coffee. about you? What about you? Coffee? Coffee. 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 Coffee is great. Miracle food. And okay. Um, <laughs> anybody, anyone last questions from the people who are probably hiding over to the other place? Um, anything else? Thank you. I just really want to thank everyone for showing up and for sticking with us. I will bring Shannon back. Uh, first of all, I wish Shannon all the best. And I will bring Shannon for, I guess we have to do season three now. You mean season I mean, four? four? This is season. See, I can't even... I can't remember my books either. Well, now we already know that we are starting to get people for season four. Uh, look forward to it. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you all. And I will, yeah, I'll be back next month on February. Oh my God. 19th, February 19th with Ken Liu. Go bigger. World go building. Bigger. Everything about world building. And then we'll do our three minute timeout. Three minutes, three seconds. I can't talk. Five seconds. Thank you all.